So I'm going to go ahead and go live there. And I need to bring up one more thing. Uh, through this one. Okay. Give me one second, everybody. Still getting this set up. Let's see. That's over there. So let's drag this one over to there. All right. Welcome, everybody. I think a lot of people are going to be joining through Zoom and through um, YouTube Live. Um, there's a class full of students here, too. Uh, I need to pull up the brochure really quick um, so that I can introduce our special guest. Um, you can go for the abbreviated version. <laughs> That's too long to say. All right. Um, let's see. What was that? <laughs> I said go for the abbreviated introduction. All right. Well, let me, uh, I'll, I'll do an abbreviated introduction, okay? Uh, I'm going to minimize this for a second. I'm going to put you over on this screen so everybody can see you. Can and... you turn the camera around so I can see the students in the classroom? Uh, yep, let's turn around. Uh... All right, are you able to see the classroom? I am. See. And we will be answering questions from here, but we won't be answering from Zoom or, or um, YouTube. All right, so... I need to move this one over just a little bit so it's better for YouTube. And today we got a very special guest. She graduated from Hope College in 1985, a few years ago, maybe before a few of you were born. But she went on and she fell in love with medical imaging. Her professor took her over to Michigan University in Ann Arbor and she saw medical imaging and she just wanted to do that. She was initially pre-med. And... Um, and so she's been doing that ever since. And she has helped uh, CT scan technology get to where it is today. And not only just the machinery, but also the clinical application. She's a director at Mayo Clinic. She's a professor of medical physics, a professor of medical in engineering, and she has like 10 other titles. Um, so let's give her a big round of applause really quick for being here. And. Uh, Okay, hey, well, um, let me just check the volume really quick. The volume's not as loud as I was hoping. Go, go ahead and speak a little bit. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen then so that uh, you can see the slides. Oh, right there. Keep going. All right, so you should see some slides now. And I'll put this in play mode. There's too many things on my screen. I can't find the PowerPoint button. Okay. All right. All right. I am set on this end. All right. I think we're set too. Okay. Well, great. Uh, it is a pleasure to uh, to give this presentation today, and um, I hope we have a little fun together doing uh, doing this. And let's go there. So I want to disclose financial support from the NIH, a company uh, Siemens Healthcare that I collaborate with, and some board memberships. So first, a little bit about me. Uh, this is the part of my world that I uh, come from. When I give talks internationally, I have to kind of show people what the Midwest uh, is. It's not Nebraska. And I was actually born in Canada, a town called Windsor, right across the river uh, from Detroit. And that's the Ambassador Bridge that links Canada and Detroit. And then I went to college at, uh, at Hope there. Um, started in 1981, graduated in 85. And then I went on to graduate school at University of Wisconsin-Madison, it's a beautiful campus, and spent six years there getting a master's and a PhD in medical physics. And from there, I was recruited to the Mayo Clinic, and I began in 1991 and have been here ever since. Uh, it's a great place, and that's a whole different talk sometime about the, the history and the uh, culture of the Mayo Clinic. 
But uh, right now, I know it doesn't look like this right now, but I sure wish I could be there in person. Uh, I have a lot of fond memories uh, from Hope. And the Pine Grove is a special one because in my senior seminar, I don't know if you still have those, but uh, Pete Jolivet, we talked him into giving us a class on the religious and philosophical implications of quantum physics. That was our senior seminar, and we mostly held class out in Pine Grove. This is a picture of the front yard uh, about, seems like eight months of the year, but it's probably only about four or five as we live out in the country. We do have a little cabin on the lake because we love water sports. Um, lake Michigan is, is very special to me. And so when we do get not winter, we, uh, my kids uh, and our family really love water sports. So here's a photo of my family. My husband, Kevin, graduated uh, with me in 1985. My daughter, Shannon, is 24. My son, Brian, is 27. And this is the newest member of our family. It's a little guy, Newton, and he is nine months old now. So just a little bit more. My professional certification is by the American Board of Radiology, and the topic is diagnostic medical physics. I have spent 24, well, I spent 24 years as the head of the CT physics program in total. And then I founded and direct the CT Clinical Innovation Center. And there was a little bit too many things on my plate. And then I transitioned to a career scientist. So that's um, my whole responsibility is research now, and I don't have the clinical responsibilities. And I was president of the American Association of Physicists in Medicine. I'll tell you a little bit about them in just a minute. So what is a medical physicist? That's my professional uh, title. And to tell you that story, I have to tell a little bit about what the American Association of Physicists in Medicine is. So when you say the word medical physics, uh, I didn't even know those two words went together uh, until my senior year, but it involves a lot of different things. So here's a word cloud, diagnostic imaging, therapy, safety, and there's all kinds of areas in medicine we work in. These top two pictures are uh, from radiation therapy treatment planning. These are uh, CT images on the right here. So medical physics is a applied branch of physics involving applying the physics concepts and methods that you learn in being trained to be a physicist towards the diagnosis and treatment of human disease. It's very interdisciplinary. In fact, the medical physics degree at uh, Wisconsin is in the medical school. So we learn about science of healthcare delivery, bio effects, optimizing imaging and therapy procedures, communicating risk benefits, and a lot on image science and image analysis. And we use a whole bunch of skills uh, that you get along the way being a physicist. The association was formed in 1958, and we have over 9,000 members today. And the purpose of the AAPM is to promote the application of physics to medicine and biology, to encourage interest and training in medical physics in the fields, and to prepare and disseminate technical information in medical physics and fields, related fields. And we do that dissemination by having two peer-reviewed journals, medical physics and journal of applied clinical medical physics, and we publish scientific reports that really set the standard for the practice of medical, medical physics in the US. And we make everything free so that developing countries and countries with aren't as many resources also have access to this. So uh, I really encourage you, if you want to know more, to visit www.aapm.org. There's a whole bunch of stuff on the website. And I'm just going to point out a few things. When you get to the home page, this is not the home page, but there's always this navigation menu on the left. And if you went to the first uh, thing I've got highlighted here, public and media, you'd see a page like this, which tells you a little bit more about what we do. And on the right side are some informational flyers that uh, go into depth and, and I encourage you to look at those if you're interested. The medical physicist tab takes you to some nice videos about uh, how people got into medical physics and what the career is like for them. And uh, on the far right is the current president elect, uh, Isan Sumay from Duke, and he 
calls us scientists in patient care. And that really is a good description of what medical physicists are. We solve a lot of problems because we're scientists. Um, and it, it is never a boring job. So if you hit the big blue button on this student uh, perspective students, you're going to learn more about how you could get involved. And because you are in the physics department, you're eligible. And I think everyone probably has membership in the Society of Physics Students. And that gets you access to all the AAPM materials for free. And then finally, if you went to grants and fellowships, um, there are some nice videos from two colleagues I know well on how they got into medical physics. So how did I get into medical physics? Well, I owe it to this gentleman. This was my advisor at Hope, Dr. Brian Kichwa. And I went off and uh, did, well, I did summer research uh, throughout, you know, summer before sophomore year, before junior year, then during the school years. But the summer before senior year, I just had to get out of the basement of Vanderbilt Hall. And so I did a missions trip for the summer and I came back and said, I've decided not to go to grad school. Uh, he informed me I was going to grad school and I said, no, I just don't care about nuclear physics. And so this discussion went on for several weeks. And finally, he says, fine, you know, I'll tell you about medical physics because his brother, Richard Hitchwa, was the director of the University of Michigan Pet Center, Positon Emission Tomography. So we arranged the uh, a trip. I was president of the uh, physics club or society of physics students group. And we went off and when Rich showed me the first image of the a human brain showing where Parkinson's disease was located that they discovered through imaging, that was it. That one image changed my life, uh, fell in love with trying to see into the human body without, without surgery. Um, a lot of students signed up to go with us, but one by one, they got too busy and we were going to Ann Arbor and one of the students was from Ann Arbor. So he said, you know, let's stay with my family for the weekend. And uh, that uh, student is Kevin and we will be married 36 years uh, this coming August. So be careful, one road trip can change your life. So what is medical imaging? It uses energy, you know, imaging has to use energy to probe the body in some way. And I'll tell you the different, some of the different ways it does this. The data collected are used to form an image and that image is a representation of some physical property of the, the object that you're imaging or the patient. Now, much of medical imaging uses electromagnetic radiation. You can see over here in uh, the very short wavelength that you've got medical x-ray imaging, pet imaging, baggage screening. So here's imaging. Imaging is also over here in the lower frequencies with MRI imaging. And uh, of course, visible light um, is, is right here in the middle. We also do imaging with ultrasonic energy. And so the medical uh, imaging range is in here. You can also do destructive uh, ultrasonic bubbles can actually uh, <clears throat> excuse me, break things up. But here's an imaging system that you guys are already familiar with, you know, a camera. But all imaging systems work the same way. There is some source of source of energy. In this case, the sun's giving us visible light. That energy interacts with your subject, in this case, a teddy bear, and that subject then somehow gives off, returns the energy, changes it somehow after that interaction that takes the source information and encodes something about that subject. And then you put a detector there and gather the energy coming off of the subject or out of the subject. And then you have collected your data then it generates an image. Now, in this case, um, the image is upside down, the cameras work, and there are these lines where some of the pixels were, were bad, to say it's a digital camera. You do some image processing, and that lets you clean up bad data. 
And then you finally do something with the image to present it and give it to a human who's going to look at it and appreciate it and maybe analyze sub features of it. So no matter what imaging system I talk about, there are all these same uh, parts of the process. So often people refer to radiography as just having an x-ray, a chest x-ray, you broke your bone, you need an x-ray. This is an x-ray tube encased in uh, the housing here. This would be a portable where a patient would put hand or elbow or something here. <clears throat> this is actually in our research unit. Fluoroscopy is moving x-rays. So if you watch, this patient is swallowing some stuff that is um, got a high atomic number, so it's barium. And this swallowing study would be to look for dysfunction in the, in the patient's esophagus or swallowing mechanism. And the image on the right is, the, is an image of the coronary arteries. So the heart is there, but the arteries on the surface of the heart have dye in that. Um, this, I don't have the movie for this, but the heart would be beating and you would watch the dye running through these vessels. And this is how they would do a coronary catheterization procedure. This catheter goes up from your groin up into your heart and they inject dye that shows up under x-ray and watch these trees of vessels uh, get filled out. Now, we're going to talk more about computerized tomography. That is my area of expertise. This is a CT scanner. A uh, patient lays on the bed, goes into the donut, and an x-ray tube is here taking data, but going all the way around. So we get images like this. This is through the abdomen. This chunk. Can you see my arrow? I want to make sure that. We can see your arrow. OK, great. Thanks. Um, we've got the liver here. Bone is very uh, attenuating, so we've got the spine, ribs, um, spleen over here, some air in the stomach. This is the ascending aorta. The lungs here are very black in this uh, rendition of the image. This is a brain. Uh, these spots are not supposed to be there, unfortunately, for the patient. And then here is lower in the abdomen, and these are the two kidneys. Now, anything we can do in big CT, we can also do at the micro level. I direct a um, research imaging core, and so we do a lot of micro CT of mice, and this way researchers can follow what's happening with the mice over time non-destructively. Now, this is a magnetic resonance machine, magnetic resonance imaging uses a completely different interaction mechanism than, than x-rays do. It actually looks at the protons in your water molecules and the spin of the nucleus. And you can make all kinds of different images actually changing the contrast. Um, so here's a brain with a MR scan. Now MR started out not making very pretty pictures but it started out being called nuclear magnetic resonance and they were really doing spectroscopy because they were putting in radio waves in the subject in a magnetic field and looking what kind of radio waves bounced back showing a resonance and that that material was present so from the spectroscopy grew the very uh, very elegant imaging we do today um, because of kind of radiation phobia and nuclear having a bad rap, they drop the word nuclear. So within medicine, it's just called magnetic, magnetic resonance imaging. Now in nuclear medicine, we use radioactive materials. We tag glucose or other materials that are going to go inside the patient's body and emit the radiation. You can take what we call planar images. So here's two detectors and they're a flat plane. This would be single photon emission computed tomography. You could also have a ring of detectors all the way around. This is a PET scanner. Okay, and again, what we can do big, we can do small. There are a lot of combining of the different techniques. I consider medical imaging like a uh, carpenter's uh, toolbox. You know, you've got hammers, you've got screwdrivers, you've got um, files and punches and all sorts of different things in your toolbox. And the physicians pull out the ones they need 
at the appropriate time. Uh, some all do some re have repetitive things they can there's overlap just like you're not supposed to but you can use the side of the wrench as a hammer um you can see cancer with all the different modalities but in different ways so here they combine ct this is the mouse the grayscale image and the pet image is showing where those radioactive chemicals flowed and then stayed and in the case of glucose, the brain is metabolizing glucose at a very high rate, so the brain lights up, and then you're also looking for some tumors, which are also very active and hungry and, and take a lot of glucose. And this is in a, a human, uh, so this is a, a cancer here, uh, and then after treatment, you can see it gets much smaller. This is a great image of how we use PET it clinically, um, I didn't have a series from a patient, but this is a mouse. We inject the radioactive material in the tail vein, and there is a, a tumor here in the lower abdomen. Um, we've got some metastases lighting up here in the brain. Mouse gets a little bigger, so tumor's still there. Now, late, late stage disease, there's, there's activity everywhere, so this cancer is spread everywhere. And Fantastically, after some treatment, you see it start to regress and the mets in the eyes go down. So imaging is used to not only diagnose, but to monitor treatment. And I think most people are familiar with ultrasound. We use it uh, prenatal to uh, see little ones in the womb. This one is getting ready to give mom a big kick. And this image is not quite so recognizable. Uh, here we've got a gallbladder and liver, and this is uh, gallstone. You can also use the Doppler effect, very physics-y thing, um, and they use it when measuring blood flow because there is the Doppler effect with the transducer, <clears throat> excuse me, the ultrasound probe. And so this, you can actually hear, this would be an audio channel as well, where you can hear the swish, swish, swish of the blood coming through. And this vessel has a stenosis. And so the nice smooth laminar flow gets very turbulent after it has to go through this narrowing. Again, fluid mechanics, very physics-y. We also can put probes inside vessels. So this little catheter at the end has a tiny ultrasound transducer, and this is inside a patient's coronary artery, and they've got plaque, calcium and cholesterol and gook in their coronary artery, and this hazy stuff out here is the wall. So we can do inside um, and imaging through, all kinds of different tools are in that medical imaging toolbox. Here is a list of them all in one place and an estimate of the spatial resolution, how small of things you can see. This changes over time, not super dramatically, but there has been a big change in CT in the last couple of years. That is my area of research, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that um, at the end of the talk. So discovery of the x-ray. Medical imaging began with this gentleman, uh, Wilhelm Conrad Röntgen, a German physicist, and he was the head of physics at Würzburg University. This is his lab here, and he was experimenting with what they call a cathode ray tube, which is kind of like a light bulb but you're putting high energy electrons into a bulb that is, uh, the air has been vacuumed out and it's got a special gas in it. So then when those electrons hit the gas, they fluoresce. And so a lot of people in that area, in that era, Edison, all, all kinds of scientists were working with this. And he, oh, little photo picture. I, I've been lucky enough to visit there. Anyone in the audience speak German? So it says, in this house discovered Röntgen in the year 1895, the after him named Rays. The order of the words would not sound so strange if we were native German speakers. So here's a photograph of inside. This is the laboratory where he discovered them. If you look at this bench here on the right, we're gonna 
zoom in on that. This is not original. This is to monitor vibrations and humidity. But this is lab equipment of the era. And <clears throat> what you've got here is this tube. This is the, the light bulb, if you will. The high voltage gets put across the tube. And if we zoom in again, you see this tube and these kind of yellowest looking plates. These were photographic plates. And they had what they call an emulsion on them that light, light interacted with and formed the photographic image. Well, he had some of these plates hanging around and somehow he started to suspect that this too was impacting them. So he took a cone of some dark paper, put it over the tube, and these plates were still getting exposed. He had no idea what was doing it. In fact, in his um, story about his life, there's some great stories. He was actually a very shy man, uh, did not like all the attention that he received. And he thought he would go down in history as that crazy physicist, because here he was believing something invisible was coming out of this. They had not experienced that before. He didn't know what it was, so he called it the X ray for the unknown variable in math. He actually lived in an apartment above this room. And when he started to see this, he was so both excited, fascinated, and horrified that he was making some incredible mistake and would be laughed at. He actually had them bring his mattress down into the lab and essentially locked himself in there, took all his meals in there, and for about six weeks until he convinced himself what he was seeing was real and he was ready to share it with the world. And that was in November of 19, excuse me, 1895. So as I said, I had a chance to visit there in 2013 on one of my trips to Germany. And uh, this uh, <laughs> cardboard paper was the only thing they'd let me touch, but I was, I was okay with that. So this is a, the first X-ray of a human. It was a Röntgen's wife, Bertha's hand, and you can see the ring on her finger, and you can see the bones. The word spread like wildfire. When he published his first, in the way they published in that era, uh, finding of it, he was commanded to give a performance and give the lecture in front of the, um, uh, no, it wasn't a king at that time. I'm forgetting the name of the German um, monarch at that time, I guess the Kaiser. Um, and he gave that lecture, and that was actually the last lecture he ever gave on it because it was treated like a, a hysteria. P women started buying lead lined underwear because they were afraid that people were going to use extra invisible rays to see under their clothing. But within the very next year, he discovered this in November of 1895, the people in the US, including Edison, were using these tubes and taking x-rays and finding bullets and bone fractures. And so medical imaging was born. So now I'm going to jump uh, way ahead in from the 18, late 1800s. I'm going to go into the mid 19th uh, century or 20th century, the mid 1900s. And there is a physicist, Alan Cormack, who wrote this theoretical paper that you could represent a function, an object, by measuring integrals through the object. And he said there could be some radiological applications. He was at Tufts University, so this was published in Journal of Applied Physics, got no attention, just kind of got buried in the, the archives until another scientist came along and did the experimental implementation of this theory. But essentially, what he's describing mathematically is an elegant way of solving a Sudoku puzzle. The x-rays look through the object at all these different angles, just like on a Sudoku puzzle, you've got those lines and sums of numbers, and you have to figure out what goes inside the puzzle box and all the little boxes inside. You have to figure out what the object is, so to speak, that if you add up the sums along the different lines, works. So you're trying to reverse engineer what was in the box. 
So uh, there's a British company, Electrical and Musical Industries, EMI. They were very well known. Um, they were sort of the General Electric of the UK. They brought broadcast television, uh, stereophonic sound, and they were also uh, the holders of the Beatles record contract. So they're most known for that, but really they played quite a role in World War II and development of radar. And so a man named Godfrey Hounsfield was actually a radar operator in the war. And the people working with him saw such genius that they encouraged him to go back and get electrical engineering training. And in his mind, he could envision this process, this Sudoku solving process. So he used a computer simulation. He developed one of the, the big first mainframe computers when he was at EMI. And so he knew computers could solve problems. And he went to their board and asked for what was considered a big sum of money at the time and says, I want to investigate using a computer to make better use of information obtained when an object is examined by gamma rays or x-rays. And this was part of his proposal. They gave him some money. And so he built this little test bed. Here's the x-ray tube and it's on a, uh, platform that would rotate at least 180 degrees around this slice of brain, real human brain, uh, no longer living and encased in plastic. And this was his detector, uh, sodium iodide detector. And this was the first image that he reconstructed. And you can see the pattern of the, the cerebral fluid and the gray white matter is, is there. It's not very elegant, but this was the beginning. So then he asked for more money to build a machine. And this was called the EMI Mark I scanner. Here's a picture of uh, Godfrey Hounsfold with his machine. And this is how a patient looked being imaged. So they were put on this table and strapped in so they didn't move around. And the head went into this hole. This could only scan the head. He'd worked on brains and also it was really slow. It took five minutes to take all the data at one slice of anatomy. And then things moved and it took data at the next slice of anatomy, each slice being about a centimeter thick. And so the whole exam took about 30 minutes, but the images were astounding. And sometimes when you look back at the story of science, how things came to light um, are, fortuitous and uh, inspirational at the same time. Hansfield thought he really had something here and he went around and tried to explain to radiologists in the UK. He's an engineer. The explanations evidently didn't go so well and he got a reputation as being this crackpot and to be avoided um, because he was really trying to convince people. Well, he came to New York to a neuroradiology conference and over to the lunch hour, they usually have someone give a talk and that canceled. And so he had talked to the organizers and said, let me tell you about what we're doing over in the UK. I've got a story. And he presented his work. It was so enthusiastic that um, one of the radiologists at this, at this event was from the Mayo Clinic. He came back, went to our board of governors and said, this is going to change medicine. We need it. And in very uncharacteristic style, uh, the Mayo Clinic Board of Governors actually wrote him a blank check and said, go, go to UK, come back with it. And um, they showed it at this very large radiological meeting again in November of 92. The physician that did believe him and did work very closely with him, Dr. James Ambrose, they presented their talk in a very uh, high profile uh, moment at the president's symposium and received a standing ovation. So finally, Hounsfield found people who believed him. And this is the Mayo Clinic. This is the EMI Mark I serial number one. So the Bud Baker that went over there, the radiologist, he was able to uh, purchase it and we installed it first. And Massachusetts General Hospital has never forgiven us for that. Um, here's an image blown up of our first patient. And so this was in June of 1973. This is the first patient done in 71. 
a patient that uh, Dr. Ambrose believed had a tumor, and you can see this here. This is from Mayo. A complete head CT exam was six Polaroid films. There wasn't digital storage by any means, so they literally took a Polaroid camera and took pictures of this little tiny screen that the reconstructed image came up on. So this is a photograph of Alan Cormack. He was actually from South Africa. Um, and then here's uh, Godfrey Hounsfield. And in 79, first patient in 1971, and in 1979, they were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for the development of computer systemography. If you like this kind of stuff and want to learn more, there is a virtual museum on the AAPM website that you can go learn, look about, learn about the history of CT, fluoroscopy, uh, lots of different uh, galleries in that virtual library or virtual museum. Okay, so in the time we have left, I think I'm doing a pan time. I wanna switch gears now, told you kind of what medical physicists do a little bit and then how I got into medical physics, history of how medical imaging came to be at least X-ray imaging. And now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what I'm doing right now. So again, here is a CT scanner, just looks like a big donut patient goes in on this table. And behind those plastic covers, there's an X-ray tube. Uh, they're a lot bigger and more powerful than those little glass tubes Röntgen and Edison used. And it emits X-rays. There is a detector or camera on the other side that can measure X-rays after they've come through the patient. And the whole apparatus is spun and, you know, PowerPoint here moved it kind of slowly for me, but in reality, it's revolving at four revolutions per second. So 250 millisecond per revolution. Now this is, you can see it's a little play. Here you're gonna see these views. This is what the detector saw. And there's some little edge enhancement processing that makes the whole thing work. And on this panel, you're gonna see the image as it's reconstructed. As more and more views are added, you get more information about your image. And that's a CT reconstruction. Not a very high quality one, but it makes the point. So here are some cool images. I always like to say CT is good from head to toe. Um, these are stents in the aorta to someone had an aneurysm and to keep their aorta from busting open, they put these metal stents. Um, we've got the heart, the heart, all the vessels in the abdomen, the bowel, bladder, some nice images of the lung. So pretty much CT is often the front door in the emergency room. If they can't figure out what's going on very quickly with the blood test off to CT, they go. And I just want to share with you something that um, well, I'm, I'm happy to share, but it's a personal moment. This patient early on after I opened up my lab, um, a surgeon called, knew we were doing innovative stuff in CT, and they had opened up this very large patient. So all of this stuff you're seeing out here is, is tissue. Uh, there's a skeleton inside that's average size, but this man was very obese. And he was undergoing surgery for um, bariatric bypass surgery, you know, uh, staple down part of the stomach. When the surgeon opened him up, they saw cancer. And because this man was so big that he couldn't get any type of imaging, the surgeon wouldn't be able to stage the cancer, know how, how advanced it was and where it was. So he wasn't going to go digging around and just start removing when he didn't know the extent. So they closed the gentleman up and said, really, there's nothing we can do for you. Go home and get your affairs in order. Uh, but the surgeon went the extra mile. He called me and he said, can I do anything? Do you have anything up your sleeve to image this patient? And so I worked with the manufacturer. I made some calls. I found out what the tolerances were before the table would actually break. And we scanned this patient and got these images, which are not gorgeous images, but they are more than sufficient to find uh, how far the cancer was advancing. And so then they went back and did cancer. And I or did the surgery to remove the cancer, extended his life by, I think, two years. 
And the day that we scanned him and were successful, the excitement of the surgeon, the gratitude of the patient, I think I floated home. I don't think my feet touched the floor because this is what gave me and gives me meaning in my work. I don't, I don't treat the patients directly, but sometimes I make the magic happen behind the scenes and that, that's where it's worth it. So let me get a little technical here. There are a type of X-ray detectors, some call them quantum detectors. They're called also photon counting detectors because they're literally clocking in through the uh, special um, computer chip each photon. Well, there's a lot of photons, 10 to the ninth photons per second per square millimeter in CT. And so these detectors, even though they'd existed in high energy physics for a long time, in nuclear medicine imaging, they weren't ready for big CT. So there had been a lot of research. These are some of the prototype systems that uh, came along and trying to get to this point where we could use these detectors in CT. So here's me at a ribbon cut, cutting with two of my colleagues. This gentleman's the head of physics at Siemens. And this is the first whole body photon counting scanner in the world. And so we were able to install this in my lab. I got a big NIH grant for it. And we started with phantoms or plastic objects, scanned cadavers, scanned animals, and eventually moved on to scanning patients. We had a second generation uh, come in in 2020 in the middle of the pandemic. That was no small feat. And then finally, in last year in April, we brought in a system that actually has an official name because um, in September of 21, so several months after we'd had it and we're doing research with it, the FDA approved this for clinical use. So for this long trajectory of developing it, it now is installed in medical centers and is a clinical imaging device. Now, why is a photon counting detector special? And I'll show you some cool images of what it can do. Traditional detectors are called scintillators and they're diced up in little blocks. The X-rays come in, they're converted to light, light spreads out. And so the light from this cell would contaminate the other cells. You want to know right where the x-rays hit, not where the light spread to. And so they uh, put, oh, the light is read by photodiodes, which convert light to electricity. And our electronic signals then go off into the computer. But they can't have that light spread out. So they put these walls in between them that we call septa, and they reflect the light back or stop it from going to its neighbor. This two-step process, we lose all the information about individual photons. The septa are dead space. They don't make light. So this is dose inefficiency. And we lose all the information about the energy of the photon. Now, this is a diagram of a photon counting detector. It's actually a semiconductor. The one we're using is cadmium telluride. A high voltage is placed across it. So there's a cathode, an anode. The anode is positively charged. Here, there's no dicing of the detector material. The dicing happens on the back end where they pull the electrons off. So x-rays come in, they create charge hole pairs. The negative charge is pulled towards the positive pick uh, pixelated anodes, and you go right to electrical signal. And we have no septa required. And what we've done here with the one-step process is retained information about the energy of the photon, and that uh, allows us to do some very special things. So the, the electrical signal that comes out looks like these pulses, this trail of pulses. And we set up energy thresholds. So let's say I put in four energy thresholds and I use one at 25 keV, all those peaks are above 25 keV. So that image would get five counts. If we put a higher threshold, only three peaks are, are above the threshold. So we get three counts. And likewise for a couple other layers. And you can also subtract between thresholds and get bins. So this is very coarse spectroscopy. The resolution is in 10s and 20s and 30s of KEV, not KEV and under. 
But what we're doing is saying, okay, I saw you, I counted you, and I know your energy is between 75 and 90, so I'm gonna put you in that bucket. And so the electronics are very fast to do all this with 10 to 9th photons streaming in at you. This is a phantom, a plastic phantom with bone material. So this would be the shoulders right here. This is state of the art, the best scanner out there of the energy integrating type. And there's this streak that's not real data and it comes from electronic noise. The signal here is so low, the noise in the electronics themselves contaminate your image. With photon counting, even though we've got all this electronic noise down here, because we put this threshold and only care about the peaks that rise above the noise, we actually can reject electronic noise and get very clean images. So patient images are more fun. This is a uh, shoulder blade, uh, airway, spine, some lungs here. And this is an area in the front of your body, you know, um, just to the two sides of your, um, the notch in your throat. And it's called the brachial plexus. You can see the different structures here with photon counting that you just can't make sense of there. The other thing that photon counting does for us is lets us see iodine better. Iodine is most attenuating at around 33 keV. This is its K edge. But integrating detectors don't, don't give much signal there. They give more signal as the energy goes up, but as the energy goes up, we don't have much iodine information. Counting detectors are very flat in their energy response. So the iodine is brighter. So here's a patient, same patient, given same amount of iodine, energy integrating detector, photon kind detector, and you can change the brightness and contrast in which you view these images. Doesn't change the data, but you can just see this is brighter. If we make a, take those bins of energy and do some physics and calculate a virtual image as if it came from just one X-ray energy, the data are so bright that you can't even see it. And so we have to widen up our window to even see what's going on here. So what that means is we can use less of this dye. Uh, this is metal. Metal makes nasty artifacts. Uh, this is a 3D printed spine and some metal uh, things that go into patient's spine if they're trying to straight, straighten a scoliosis patient. So this cre uh, creates all kinds of metal artifacts. With the photon counting, we can move our photon energy by putting in tin filter and we move to the higher energies. We look at the higher energies only and we can see so much better. Um, now I need to finish up quickly here. So when we make the energy integrating detectors and we want better resolution, we need them to be smaller. And so we can dice them smaller and smaller, but we have more and more of these septas that doesn't happen with photon counting detectors. And so we also uh, don't need to, this is a way that we used to get higher resolution. We would put lead combs, this thing over here, lead bars in front of it. You could make them both ways and then get a grid. And now your detector pixel is this tiny, small green square, square instead of the big one. And so you got better resolution. That was the best we could get. You wasted dose. So here is an image. This is uh, someone's ear. Where's my cursor? This is someone's ear. And this is part of their skull with the inner ear bones called the temporal bones. And you can see things the same. The noise level, this number here is about the same but we used 85% less dose. Now at these doses, the radiation is very safe. It's not gonna hurt anyone, but people get a lot of images. And so our job is to use as little as possible as long as we're getting good images. So this, now I'm gonna just show you some show and tell, just kind of show off a little. This is on a conventional scanner. This is on the photon counting scanner. This is a lesion here from a multiple myeloma patient. We have used some AI convolutional neural networks to reduce the noise when we made it very thin. So the slice of anatomy that we are looking at is 0.6 millimeter thick. This is a mammogram image with these microcalcifications. CT 
would never even be thought of big CT with mammography. And just to show what our, our AI processing is doing in the lab, this is what the image looked like off the scanner the, of the patient's breast. This is after we have removed the noise and we can see these same calcifications. So we won a couple awards for this work already uh, because it's, it's pushing CT to an era and an area that it's never been before. So this, this is a lot of bowel in the abdomen. You can just see how much sharper things are. This is a femur, head of your, of your hip bone, and you can see the trabecular bones inside. This is lung imaging, and you can just see, again, what spatial resolution we're able to get. This is another bone example. You don't need this high resolution to see this break, but it's an example of the trabecular function, uh, trabecular structure that we can see. Another example there. This is another inner ear. This patient has a stapes prosthesis. This is a metal implant that a surgeon has put in. And this is what the conventional system saw. And this is what we are able to see using less dose. I got an email trail and the subject line was really freaking awesome images because <laughs> You can see this red arrow, there's a little canal, there's a little black space, and they can follow that canal and a nerve runs through there. They've not seen that before. This is a stent for a coronary artery. And here we have imaged it in, in uh, some pigs where you can't tell on the conventional system if that is open or not. And you can on the photon counting. This is patient's brain. They've got a meningioma. And um, with the photon counting, seeing all that extra iodine, the surgeons were able to see this tail that they really didn't know was present on this image. Here's a um, blood vessel up by the eyes. And you can see it's got a little pinch in it. We call that stenosis. With the photon counting, you can see so much better. If we go to the sharpest resolution, it looks horrible because of all the noise. If we do our CNN denoising, then we can actually see the structure of this plaque that's uh, impinging on this artery. Okay, and to close up, uh, cardiac imaging. This is a left anterior descending coronary artery that has been straightened out with image processing. Here's the pictures of them running across the heart, we can do this in motion. So we can watch the heart beating, the valve opening and closing. I didn't put in movies because movies always screw up when you're giving a presentation, it's a fact of life. Um, but we have this energy information so we can make all kinds of different images. We can actually even remove this iodine signal to see the calcified uh, plaque and some calcium here in the aorta. And this is an image that wowed the people in our field. This was our first patient. We ran some, some uh, experimental software on it. This patient has a lot of calcium. This isn't all the dye. The dye is about this bright. This really bright stuff is calcium. So he's got severe atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries. With the energy information, we are able to say, hey, there's that much calcium in it, we're gonna subtract it out and now you can see what is actually open and you couldn't see it here. So with that, I better close up. Photon counting detectors have a lot of uh, advantages and have really brought a new era of CT into the field. And I wanna acknowledge uh, the, my co-director, physician uh, radiologist, J.G. Fletcher and two of my physics colleagues, Li Feng Yu and Shai Lang, they're amazing. And some pictures of our team. This is our usual team meeting. This is our 20, or team photo. This is our 2020 team photo. And, and finally, I want to thank Hope College because uh, without uh, my education there and working in research and arguing with Dr. Hitchwa, I wouldn't be where I am now. So I hope that was interesting. All right, thank you. Let's give Dr. Spino a round of applause. Okay, right. and I can and stop. We, and a few students had to take off. I'm going to end the uh, Facebook yeah. uh, stream.
and we can switch over.